Okay, thanks, uh, Dan. Thanks, uh, uh, Sepedi, also for um, inviting me. Okay, um, so today um, my talk is about um, this book by uh, Pierre Dardon and Christian Laval. Uh, it's called um, uh, Marx Prénom Karl. It was published in 2012. Um, it's a very big book. Um, I'm going to try to summarize the, you know, the, the central threads of its arguments, but um, actually I won't, um, the, the end of, I don't really have a, a proper conclusion. I don't, I wasn't able to kind of, you know, tie everything together in the way in which I'd hoped to. So what, you know, I really just want to kind of introduce the, uh, you know, the, the lines of investigation that they kind of chart in this book. Um, and then we can, you know, hopefully, hopefully kind of discuss um, their implications um, in the discussion. Um, the book, so I'm going to give a kind of a, this PowerPoint presentation, again, trying to kind of summarize, um, you know, the, the main kind of lines of argument in the book. Um, the first, so it begins with, um, you know, an account of um, the, what they call the process of, um, um, you know, the way in which humans produce and reproduce the material conditions of their existence. And uh, they, you know, they kind of, they draw attention to um, the specifics of Marx's account of this, especially in his, uh, you know, in, in his early work in the German ideology in particular. And then they tie this to an account of the logic of capital. Okay, so the first, um, the opening move is a contrast between um, what they call the strategic logic of class struggle um, and the, the speculative logic of um, capital. Um, the second part of the talk will really go into the, their, you know, the, you know, the, the middle section of the book, which is their, their reconstruction of the logic of capital, which involves kind of, um, you know, reconstructing Marx's relationship to Hegel. And it's, it's in a way, it's the trickiest part. It'll be the, you know, it's, it's a, the, the hardest material, um, but then it reconnects this whole kind of, you know, rather arcane debate about the, um, you know, the, uh, the finer points of Marx's analysis of the commodity culminates in, um, you know, a re-articulation of the relationship between, you know, capital and labor and, you know, the, 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 the role of class struggle. Um, and, um, I won't, uh, yes, and, th and that's the, the third and final kind of part of the presentation doesn't really, I, you know, I don't succeed in bringing those two together, but, um, you know, we can hopefully discuss this. Okay, so, um, Pierre Dardon and Christian Laval are not, um, you know, are both elderly French academics. They're both in their late 60s. I think Dardot was born in 52 and Laval in 53. Um, Christian Laval is a professor of sociology at the uh, University of uh, Paris 10 Nanterre. Um, and he, he is known, um, he had uh, published, um, you know, several works on Jeremy Bentham. He's known as a kind of a specialist in the work of Bentham. Since 2007, Dardon Laval have published, you know, um, a remarkable number of books, nine books. So they published, you know, these nine books, which, which you see here. Um, I think three of which have been translated into English. Okay. Um, so the, um, the New Way of the World, which, you know, that was from 2009, was published by Verso in uh, 2017. Uh, Common uh, on Revolution in the 21st Century was published by Bloomsbury Academic in 2019. Um, and... Uh, you know, Never Ending Nightmare, The Neoliberal Assault in Society was published also by, by Verso in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and they've since 
you know, published three more books, you know, in the, you know, in the last three or four years. So um, Dardot, as far as I know, had never published um, anything except for, well, he wrote a PhD thesis in the 1980s, which obviously has plays a kind of a, a central role in their account of Marx. Um, but um, so it's really, there's this long silence and then this explosion of productivity in the last, you know, really uh, 12 or 13 years. Now, unfortunately, the book I'm talking about today, which is the, the Marx book published in 20, 2012, which is the longest of all these books, it's like 800 pages, is not, you know, has not been translated, which is um, a, a pity because it's really a remarkable work and it's remarkable because of the way in which it combines um, historical erudition um, and really, um, you know, intricate conceptual analysis. So it's, uh, it's, it's really kind of a remarkable achievement. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I don't know if I agree with all its theses, but I'm just going to try to kind of lay them out for you today as clearly as I can. Um, the opening, um, in a way that their entire account um, is based, um, their account of the importance of um, material reproduction in Marx's account is based on glossing two very famous quotes from Marx, one from the German ideology and the, the second from the 18th Premier. Uh, the first is this um, from the opening of the, the German ideology. Um, where they say the presuppositions from wh where Marx and Engels write, the presuppositions from which we begin are not arbitrary ones, not dogmas, but effective presuppositions. And this is, the English translation sometimes has like real presuppositions, um, but actually the German is Wittlichen Vorausinsung, excuse my pronunciation, it's terrible. But as Dardon Laval pointed out, this is really, you know, Marx does not choose this expression you know, arbitrarily. It's a very kind of, it's, it's uh, you know, pregnant with philosophical significance, this um, you know, concept of effective presuppositions. Um, so these, um, you know, these effective presuppositions um, are the real individuals, their activity and the material conditions of their life, both those which they find already existing and those produced by their activity. And these premises can thus be verified in a purely empirical way, okay? Um, so the key idea here is that there are already existing conditions which provide the starting point for human productive activity. And from this starting point, humans produce new conditions. And I don't know, I'll take this to be the kind of the, you know, the primacy of practice you know, what uh, Marx's practical materialism, you know, as, um, you know, expressed certainly around 1845 in the German ideology, but also in the thesis on Feuerbach, is the claim that, um, you know, humans, um, you know, it's, um, the, we have to take into account um, the practices through which produce and reproduce um, their material conditions in order to understand um, the you know, thoughts relationship to reality or consciousness's relationship to reality. Um, the second quote is from you know, the 18th Vermeer, um, which really is, is a kind of, it's written you know, later, but it's really a kind of a, a version of the same thought, uh, which is that past production conditions present production. And so Marx famously writes, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. Okay. So now we were able to gloss this concept of effective presuppositions. Okay. Um, and it's basically the, the idea that human activity is both determined by existing conditions and productive of new conditions. And it is this circuit of conditioned and conditioning activity that is the empirically, as opposed to logically, effective starting point for materialist theory. Um, now these effective presuppositions are empirically verifiable insofar as they are 
concretely sensuous, you know, which, um, you know, which is not the same as simply kind of empirically perceptible. So that, that this, the contrast between sensuous and super sensuous, which Marx takes over from Feuerbach, which I think is really rooted to, you know, to Kant, to the kind of the, the distinction between, you know, phenomena and noumena, um, it doesn't map on to the kind of the familiar um, empiricist distinction between the perceptible and the imperceptible. To say that, so in other words, the realm of the sensuous is not simply coextensive with what is, um, you know, um, given in sensation or immediately access accessible to sensory perception. Um, so they are empirically verifiable, but, but they are not merely empirical. These effective presuppositions are not, you know, kind of directly empirically perceptible. Um, they are not abstract data. Okay, they're not purely kind of, you know, ab you know, conceptual abstractions, but nor are they merely empirically perceptible matters of fact of the kind favored by empiricism. Um, so this concept of effective presuppositions is opposed both to the given presuppositions of empiricism and to the posited presuppositions of idealism. And in a way, this, you know, the, the articulation of, you know, what is given and what is posited is, you know, something that uh, you know, we'll discuss in much greater detail shortly. Um, Empiricism assumes certain objective facts as given without inquiring into their conditions or how they came about. And the whole point is that the effective presuppositions tell us the historical conditions under which um, a state of affairs came to be generated, was socially you know, generated through this practical human activity. Uh, idealism, on the other hand, turns every factual premise into the result of the subject's productive activity. Um, so idealism abstracts from the empirical altogether, um, but in doing so, it's in a way it kind of, um, you know, it reifies, you know, self-consciousness or subjectivity as this autonomous sphere of um, cognitive activity. And in fact, it separates cognition um, and intellectual cognition from its, um, you know, from the, the human life process, from the, uh, you know, the social, you know, the total social process of which it is a part. Um, so the effective presuppositions for historical materialism are the social productive activities of humans. That's why it's, it says effective presuppositions, plural, and not simply effective presupposition in the singular. Um, it's, humans in the plural, not humanity, you know, as this abstract generic subject. Um, and these humans bring about the empirical states of affairs that are, that are either objectified by empiricism or subjectified by idealism. Okay. Now, at this point, the claim is that this, you know, the, um, if the effective presupposition is this, you know, practical productive activity, um, carried out by you know, a multiplicity of you know, human social subjects, it doesn't presuppose um, you know, a constituted subject or agent, okay? And this is something that Dardot Naval also emphasized. And here I've used a couple of quotations from, their, from the translation of a comment. Um, so what they, they define praxis as the self-production of its subject through the auto alteration of the actor in the very course of action. So in other words, this kind of practical productive activity is, it doesn't kind of, um, you know, unfold from a fully constituted, you know, homogenous subject. Um, it actually, you know, um, you know, the subject is generated in and through this, you know, productive practical activity. Um, and um, secondly, they, you know, they, they define instituting praxis as the self-production of a collective subject in and by the continuous co-production of the rules of right and law. So in a way, um, a social subject, a collective social subject is instituted through this, um, you know, practical activity. Um, as which you know generates um, you know norms you know, you know norms of uh, 
of conduct, standards of behavior, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so the key thing is that um, the idea, the, you know, the, um, um, the effective presupposition of um, human practical activity does not require the hypothesis of, you know, uh, of an agent, okay, of a of an independently existing um, agent or subject. Um, okay. So now, and this, and what the first definition that they give of struggle, of class struggle, is that this, you know, the um, this you know productive practical activity, um, you know is uh, you know shaped by social conflict and social antagonism okay so the first um, you know definition of class struggle given by Davidon Laval is that um, class struggle is a, is, is a struggle in which the process of struggle constitutes the agents of, of the struggle okay um, which is also to say that class is engendered through stuff through struggle and does not pre-exist it okay but then the constitution of class through struggle generates economic conditions that reconstitute class and in a way the kind of um, the emergence of capital and the, the capitalist class relation in a way reshapes um, the um, the, uh, the nature and the structure of class, okay? Um, so um, there's two distinctions to be made. That, you know, first, the constitution of class through economic reproduction, class as constituted in and through the reproduction of capital, and the constitution of class through social struggle. In a way, the, 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 the class struggle, you know, um, through which the capital relation was originally instituted. Okay. Um, and this is the first kind of, um, you know, um, summary or schematic, um, you know, definition we can give of the two logics, of the two logics um, which Dardon Laval identified in Marx. One being the strategic logic of class struggle as a process of transformations of the conditions of antagonism that is also the process of the self-transformation of its agents and a speculative logic of capital as producing and reproducing its conditions of development. Okay. Um, now, so, but in order to understand the articulation of the strategic logic of class and the speculative logic of capital, or in a way, or human kind of, you know, human social reproduction and, um, you know, capital reproduction, we have to understand um, what um, speculation, what speculative reflection means. Okay. And here, we need to kind of you know revisit you know Hegel's logic of essence, um, and Dardon Laval are, are adamant, and you know it's uh, you know have a considerable amount of te textual evidence to, to substantiate the claim that the logic of capital um, is modeled on the logic of essence. Now that's not an original claim. Lots of people have made it, but the way in which they, you know, they, um, they defend it or is, uh, is, is original, I think. Okay. So, um, Hegel distinguishes between, um, three moments of reflection, you know, positing reflection, external reflection and determining reflection. Um, the logic of reflection in Hegel is the logic of, you know, um, of relation. Um, it's the relation of mediation and immediacy. Okay, um, you know, essence, you know, follows the kind of, um, you know, follows being, and the initial moment of essence is positing reflection, um, which Hegel defines. You know, I've, I've tried to keep these definitions as simple as, as possible because otherwise it's it's just a kind of it's a nightmare trying to wade through um, Hegel's account of the logic of essence. So, 
Positing reflection is a positing in as much as it is immediacy as a turning back. That is to say, there is not an other beforehand, one either from which or to which would turn back. It is therefore only a turning back or as a negative of itself. And in a way, Dardot Naval usefully kind of, you know, they, they really try to kind of explain this through um, you know, the, uh, the analogy of light, okay, it's, you know, it's light that, ref, you know, that is reflected. Um, and in positing reflection, um, it's, uh, it's reflection that is immediately, it's as if, you know, light is um, reflected back into itself without, um, in a way in which, it cancels itself out. Um, it doesn't have any, um, you know, there's no, in a way, it can only relate to itself by bouncing back from something, you know, from a, a surface, a reflecting surface. Um, but because it only, you know, it is only as this, this, this process of, you know, reflection or bouncing back, there is no, image okay there's nothing nothing is reflected there's a there's a reflection without anything being reflected and that's why hegel describes it as a movement from nothing to nothing okay nothing is generated through this process of reflection um that's why it's it's, it's a negative of, it, of itself and then we have external reflection okay so the this is number two. so reflection in positing immediately sublates its positing and so it has an immediate presupposition. It, it therefore finds this presupposition before it as something from which it starts and from which it only makes its way back into itself, negating it as its negative. So here, the idea is that an external reflection, reflection is reflected back from an image, okay? There is a, you know, a reflecting instance, but reflection forgets that this, um, you know, this, um, you know, the, the, the reflecting instance is itself, um, is its own product or its own result. Okay, so it treats, you know, the, the image, the mirror image um, from which it bounces back into itself as something that exists separately and independently. In other words, it, it, it treats the, um, the image as external to the movement of, of reflection, okay? Um, in other words, it's something is posited, but the movement of positing has been erased or denied. Okay, so in the first, in, in positing reflection, you've got positing, but positing that, you know, doesn't generate, you know, uh, a posited, posit, you know, a positive posited thing. So that keeps on kind of, you know, vanishing into itself. In the second movement, you've got, um, you know, the positing of something, of something posited, but then the, the movement of positing is cancelled or, or negated. Um, so it finds itself relating, you know, bouncing back from something which is taken to be, you know, external and independent to it. And finally, the third movement brings together positing and external reflection. So this is determining reflection. Um, the positing is now united with external reflection. In this unity, the latter, the positing, is absolute presupposing. That is the repelling of reflection from itself or the positing of determinateness as its own. So now, now Instead of having you know, the positing um, and the posited as separate moments, they are brought together so that positing understands itself as always um, you know, relating to a posited instance, but now it doesn't forget that this posited instance is its own product or something that it has generated itself. So now the presupposition is positive, okay? It's instead of having something which is simply presupposed as, 
external and kind of independent, um, it's no the uh, the presupposition is no fully you know um, integrated into the act of positing. Okay, so this is the positing of the presupposition, and this is determining reflection. Um, now this. You know, so that one of our claims, like kind of this model, you know, um, um, determining reflection is, you know, the the core of um, idealism of, you know, or that, that the logic of speculation um, is, um, you know, governed by um, determining reflection. Okay. Um, so speculation, the kind of idealist speculation that you know Marx is setting himself against, um, you know, um, unites the acts of positing and pre presupposing, or if you want, of making and taking. You know, positing is the act of making of producing, whereas presupposing is the act of taking something that is already there. And idealism, you know, in, in the positing of, of, of presuppositions in idealism is the unification of making and taking. Okay, but then you get this 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 closed kind of a circle. Okay, the positing of the presuppositions means that there's no longer a kind of a you know transcendent exteriority um, for reflection. And but for Hegel, that's Hegel's whole whole point is that there's um, um, thinking can't simply um, uh, that anything that you know um, is you know assumed taken as given or kind of assumed to be you know already constituted already kind of conditioned um, involves a kind of a deliberate abstracting from the conceptual movement through which that you know um, that datum has been shaped and determined, okay? Um, but practical human activity separates positing and presupposing, okay? So it's, or making and taking. Um, so it's both conditioned and conditioning, but there is no, unlike in, um, in idealist speculation, um, what is conditioned and the conditioned object and the conditioning activity are separated okay they're no longer kind of fused together in this kind of um in this circle um and in a way it's you know the the, the logic this you know the the logic that one level credit marks with kind of discovering a kind of a, a logic of history because the logic of history is this um you know this the movement from condition to conditioning okay we you know human activity or human production um you know produces um you know um, structures and institutions and relations um which by which it is then subsequently um conditioned okay so there's a conditioning a productive conditioning um you know, moment in human activity, um, which generates kind of, you know, relations, forms, institutions. Um, but this is a temporal process and these, um, um, you know, relations, forms and institutions then become the objective framework within which, um, you know, subsequent, you know, productive activity unfolds. Okay, so it's the movement from the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the present generation produces the conditions, you know, um, which will shape the productive activity of their successors. Okay. Um, so here's um, a, a lengthy quote from Dardon Laval about the importance of this, um, you know, the, the distinction of the way in which Marx rearticulates uh, positing and presupposing. In the schema of speculative reflection, the initial immediacy has the place of an originary positing. It posits exteriority as autonomous with regard to itself by repelling itself from itself 
or by negating its first act of positing. This is the first presupposition. Without this initial moment of positing reflection, the subsequent process cannot follow. For if external reflection starts from the immediacy resulting from this act, it is by separating it from this act, i.e. by taking it as a given immediacy that is already there. Only then can there be a return to the first immediacy. The given immediacy resulting from the first presupposition interiorizes its own origin by positing the given immediacy as its ground. This is the second presupposition. Um, but only the simplicity of the first immediacy renders possible the return into self accomplished by the second presupposition. But the distinction between the presuppositions of speculative formation and those of effective reality has as its major theoretical consequence the evacuation of any specifiable site for the first immediacy whose role is to engage the entire process. The dialectic of the two sorts of presupposition is the radical destitution of the speculative thesis of the originariness of positing relative to its external conditions of formation capital is in a relation analogous to that which external reflection has to the given immediacy which is its starting point first it finds them already there and then once born from them it cancels their exteriority through its own act okay. so Gadon Laval's argument is that capital initially um, capital starts from um, given presuppositions okay the uh, the development and the formation of capital um, starts from given historical conditions um, but once capital comes into being um, it starts to posit its own presupposition it starts to kind of you know to produce its own um, um, conditions of existence. And in a way, so what I don't know if I want to do is to distinguish between um, historical conditions of emergence um, and um, um, what they call, um, you know, actual conditions of existence, okay? So, um, the claim, the argument, um, as I understand it, is that it's um, capital comes into being as a result of human productive activity, human, you know, social practice. Um, but then once the capital relation um, has been instituted, then capital starts to kind of, you know, reshape and reconfigure every aspect of human practical activity in order to to serve its own you know to guarantee its own reproduction okay so what capital um capital's historical conditions are um initially ex external to it okay they're like they're given presuppositions but capital gradually integrates them within itself it posits these initially external presuppositions. It cancels their exteriority through its own act. Um, so the process then of the process of historical development is a process of reflection in that it is activity of positing and of presupposing. But this does not make it a speculative process because it excludes any originary positing and the return to a first immediate. And this is the key claim for what uh, about is that the difference capital, the logic of capital is, um, you know, specular and speculative. Um, however, um, there is no, um, you know, 
capital does not kind of proceed from an originary positing, an originary self-positing. Okay, there is no first immediacy from which um, you know capital arises um, to posit its own presuppositions, and this is important because in their um, reconstruction of Marx's uh, method um, in uh, in Capital, especially in Volume One of Capital, um, the reason why Marx starts from the commodity form. Is precisely because the um, the the commodity form um, is um, you know as as a cell form of capital's reproduction is itself split. It's not uh, it's not simply a kind of a pure. It's not an immediate self relation. It is a mediated self relation. So the commodity form, the commodity is kind of is internally split between the aspects of you know use and exchange, um, but this split um, is precisely irreducible to any originary immediacy, um, the, the originary, the first immediacy of positing reflection. Um, and we'll, we'll see this uh, in a moment. Um, so the, the logic of the process of historical development on their account is a non-speculative logic of reflection in which the act of positing and presupposing can only be accomplished on the basis of historical conditions that are external to it. Um, okay, um, and in a way, the summary to see how this, you know, their accounts of um, you know the effect of presuppositions and the uh, the way in which effective presuppositions um, can be articulated with capital's positing of its own presuppositions is summarized in Dardot's 1988 PhD thesis on um, the question of the beginning of science in Hegel and Marx. This is a very useful, this is, um, this is Dardot's own kind of description of, of the thesis. Um, and it encapsulates, you know, the arguments actually that is developed in, uh, you know, well, 30 years later in, uh, in the Marx book. So Dardot writes, Hegel begins with pure being, Marx with the commodity. But whereas pure being is the simple itself, the commodity is only the simplest, okay? Um, in other words, it's the simplest, um, you know, it's the simplest um, instance of the self-relation that constitutes capital. Um, and so that, that's why capital uh, is not, um, you know, simply can, you know can't be identified to the kind of, you know, immediate self relation that um, is exemplified by you know uh, the sheer you know the the sheer indeterminateness of, of being pure being at the beginning of Hegel's science of logic. Within this infinitesimal divergence, an essential part of Marx's debate with Hegel comes into play. What is at stake here is the status of a key concept, the concept of presupposition. The first meaning of this term for Hegel is anything which is given from outside to thought, any external datum in which thought is alienated. The simplicity of the Hegelian beginning expresses merely the fact that pure thought is without presupposition. But for Marx, the notion of real or what he will later call effective presupposition, indicates an object given before any thought. And thus the presupposition of political economy as a science is capitalist society, whose simplest element is precisely the commodity. But from 1857 onwards, Marx gives another meaning to this concept, one directly inherited from the Hegelian doctrine of reflection. And according to this second meaning, the commodity is defined as capital's elementary presupposition. The logic of this borrowing from Hegel required that the commodity be reduced to the pure immediacy of a self-relation. But instead, Marx will think the commodity as a social relation with two aspects. One is the immediacy of use value. The other is the positive being of value. 
and as a result, Marx will encounter difficulties he will never overcome. Um, so the key feature of Marx's analysis of the commodity, and the reason why Marx begins with the commodity and not, for instance, with value, um, as you know, some people think, you know, some commentators think would have been a more um, you know, logical starting point, is um, because the, uh, in a way, the commodity encapsulates, um, you know, capital self relation, but it encap, you know, it encapsulates it as a way which is, um, in a way, never. Um, which is contradictory, okay? Because capital's self-relation is contradictory, and in order to understand this um, you know, contradictoriness, it has to be unfolded from the analysis of the commodity form. Um, and this is what um, Dardot and Laval then, be, you know, do when they move to their accounts of capital. Okay, in the central sections of, of the book. Um, um, okay, so we know, again, you know, everyone knows that uh, the commodity has two aspects. Um, it's composed of you know, use value and exchange value. Um, and the, you know, the, the dualism of use and exchange um, is you know, um, connected to the duality of labor, the double character of labor as concrete labor and abstract labor. But it's, it's a mistake, say Dardot and Laval, to think um, that um, abstract labor corresponds to exchange value, whereas concrete labor corresponds to use value. Um, you can't map um, you know, the, um, the, you know, the duality of uh, concrete and abstract labor onto the duality of um, use and exchange. Um, and they also want to point, point out that um, although um, abstract labor is often understood as the abstraction from the qualitative specificity of various types of concrete labor, but what they point out, and something which is, I think, often elided in accounts of abstract labor, is that abstract labor itself has a qualitative characteristic. In other words, you know, abstract labor, as measured in you know socially, as you know, abstract labor is a substance of value, as a um, socially necessary, you know, abstract labor time. Um, but this is there's a qualitative homogeneity to um, abstract labor, which, which is the, you know, the condition for its quantitative heterogeneity. So in other words, it's, it's a mistake simply to, to oppose um, you know, concrete to abstract labor as quality to quantity. You know? um, concrete labor is qualitatively heterogeneous, whereas abstract labor is quantitatively, you know, um, um, you know um, is merely quantitatively heterogeneous. But this quantitative heterogeneity of abstract labor presupposes a qualitative homogeneity. Um, so they write, um, for abstract human labor or value forming labor is itself defined by the qualitative identity of labors differing from one another in terms of magnitude of value, which is to say quantitatively. The double character of labor, which is exposed in a double manner in value and use value is not identical with the quantitative and qualitative character of labor because the character of the labor that is formative of value is itself also qualitative and not only quantitative. Abstractly human labor is only susceptible to quantitative determination because it is first and foremost the qualitative identity of quantitatively different labors expressed in Marx's own language. 
the differential determination of the magnitude of value presupposes the identity of the substance of value. Um, and okay, the second, um, you know, um, the substance of value is constituted by um, the, the, the reflexive relations um, among commodities, okay? So value is a relation and it's a relation among commodities. Um, you know, the, uh, the simple, the kind of the elementary or the, uh, the isolated form of value is, you know, um, in Marx's famous you know, equation, you know, 20 yards of linen equals one coat. Um, the, um, the, uh, the linen is, has a relative value, which is expressed in the coat, which is the equivalent value. Um, and as Marx uh, famously explains, it is um, you know, the use value of the coat that expresses um, the value of the linen. Okay. Um, so um, this, you know, the, the value relation is governed by um, a, a speculative logic in which um, diversity, you know, the um, or mere kind of difference uh, eventually becomes opposition. And it's this um, development of the simple kind of, you know, the, the diversity, uh, you know, the manifoldness um, of, um, you know, the, the value relations amongst commodities, which is developed into opposition. This is what um, the analysis by Dardon Laval is charting. Um, so Marx writes, by means therefore of the value relation expressed in our equation, the bodily form of commodity B, i.e. the coat, becomes the value form of commodity A, i.e. the linen, or the body of commodity B acts as a mirror to the value of commodity A. And the fact, I mean, even though, you know, Marx's use of the term mirror, the, the claim that one commodity mirrors the value of another commodity, you know, is a key, you know, is, is an obvious kind of reference to the, you know, the logic of reflection. Um, by putting itself in relation with commodity B as value in, you know, in proper persona, in its own person, as the matter of which human labor is made up, which is to say, you know, abstract human labor, the commodity A converts the value in use B into the substance in which to express its A's own value. The value of A thus expressed in the use value of B has taken the form of relative value. Um, so value then is a, this um, reflexive relation. Um, the value form through which the use value or body of one commodity becomes a phenomenal form of the value of another. Um, the, uh, you know, the body of the coat is the phenomenal form for the value of the linen, in Marx's example. Um, it, this accomplishes the reflection of each of the single commodities, two opposing determinations into one another, i.e., the opposing determinations of value and use value. Um, ultimately, it is the reflection of the value of a commodity in the use value of another and vice versa that remedies the impossibility of the relation of the value of a commodity to its own use value and hence the impossibility of its immediate self-relation. So what, what, what is the point here? The point is that value is not an immediate self-relation. Okay, value is a relation, but it's a, you know, a specular relation. It's a reflexive relation amongst a kind of, uh, you know, um, amongst different, you know, a variety or a, a manifold of commodities. Okay. Um, and that's why um, Marx starts from the commodity and not from value. Okay. Even though it's, you know, it's, it seems that, you know, money, Commodities and monies are 
um, you know, ultimately forms of value or embodiments of value. Um, but value can only um, manifest itself in, first of all, in the uh, the diversity and then of commodities, and then ultimately in the you know the opposition and the contradiction that is constitutive of the commodity. Um, or as Marx puts it, you know, by positing itself as equivalent to the other commodity, it relates to itself as value. In relating to itself as value, the commodity simultaneously differentiates from itself as use value. Um, okay, again, so this is Dardon Laval now. Um, the analysis of the commodity and the simple value form obliges us to specify that Marx will hence, henceforth conceive the internal structure of the social relation within the double element of reflection, which is to say, as unity of immediacy and mediation, precisely in opposition to the simplicity of the simple self-relation. Um, okay. Uh, um, the point is that there's a social relation. Capital is a relation. It's a social relation, um, but it's um, it's a social relation which articulates, you know, mediation and immediacy, and it's a social relation which is encapsulated in the commodity. Okay, so, so the claim is that you know the capitalist social relation is you know embodied in the commodity. And you can only understand the specificity of the capitalist social relation by unpacking uh, the internal structure of the commodity. Um, um, so initially, so from diversity, we move to opposition. Um, reflection transforms the relation of indifferent exteriority of the two sides of the commodity, use and exchange, into a relation of internal opposition. Okay. Um, so in other words, the exchange value of one commodity can only be embodied in the use value of another commodity. Okay, another, no, no, um, a commodity can only you know, manifest its value in relation to another commodity and in relationship to the, you know, the, you know, the, the use value of another commodity, um, which is why um, the, uh, you know, the, the positions of relative and equivalent value um, are um, um, irreversible, okay? A commodity can't, sim no commodity can simultaneously play the role of equivalence and relative value. It always has to be, um, uh, they have to, you know, to be repositioned vis-a-vis uh, -vis one another in order to express um, these, the two aspects um, of, um, you know, that they possess, the two aspects of their um, nature as commodities. Um, but eventually, but this, relation of simple um, you know exteriority is gradually internalized okay, into the into the two poles of the relation so as reflected into one another the two aspects of the commodity are opposed and not merely indifferent and the relation of opposition is one of reciprocal exclusion and internal constitution of the opposing Term. So, what is Mark? Okay, again, what, what, what's, what's going on here? He's saying that initially, um, you know, in most commodities, um, use and exchange are, you know, ex, you know, stand to one another in a relation of uh, indifferent exteriority. Okay, um, you need. Um, Another commodity to express the you know the exchange value of one commodity, um, but there is a commodity in which 
use and exchange become a reflected into one another, okay, in which the two aspects of the commodity are, are opposed and not merely indifferent. And that commodity is labor power. Um, um, okay, so this is why Marx introduces the commodity labor power, okay, into, you know, at a, a stage of the, uh, the development, the analysis of the commodity form. For the worker himself, um, labor power only has use value insofar as it is exchange value and not insofar as it produces exchange value. Labor only exists as use value for capital, and it is the use value of capital itself, i.e. the mediating activity through which the latter expands. Um, so this is the, in a way, the contradiction. It's it, Labor power is the commodity that expresses the contradictoriness, which is latent in the commodity form, and the contradictoriness which is um, you know, fully, you know, effectuated in, um, you know, the, the capitalist social relation. Um, so Marx, so this is Dado and Laval glossing Marx now. Um, um, we see that the commodity labor power, because of its specific use value, and it, 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 it's the commodity that is used to produce value, okay? It's a commodity um, that is used to produce every other commodity, and therefore, um, you know, the use value of labor power is to create value, um, and ultimately surplus value. Um, so because of its specific value, which is to say its aptitude for producing surplus value, is one at the same time capital as use value of capital and non-capital as pure potentiality of labor absolutely separated from all the objective conditions of production. Um, at the same time, and with respect, so the claim is that labor power is a potency or a capacity um, which is actualized in, you know, specific concrete labors, okay, um, but on, until it is um, actualized, you know, as this, um, you know, actualized as this kind of, you know, um, value creating activity, it exists merely as a pure potentiality. And, and, and as a pure potentiality, labor power is nothing, okay? It's a, it's a pure, it doesn't, you know, it's, it has no, it has no actuality, okay? Um, labor power is actualized in its use in the production process. Um, but, you know, apart from that concrete actualization, it's just this pure potentiality, okay? But as a pure potentiality, which is separated from the objective conditions of production, from the means of production, it is effectively, you know, it's, it's null. It is socially, you know, null. Um, so this is why it's both capital and non-capital. It's capital because, you know, it can only be used by capital. It's, it's constitutive of labor power, that labor power is bought by the capitalist and used by the capitalist to produce, um, you know, value and ultimately surplus value. Um, that's why its use value belongs to the capitalist. Um, and, you know, you know, independently of this, um, of its use by the capitalist, you know, in the capitalist production process, it is just this, um, um, it's, it's not capital, but it's this pure kind of, uh, you know, this um, empty virtuality. Okay, so to continue the quotation, um, at the same time, and with respect to the same relation, because it is as potentiality or faculty that it is non-capital and capital, non-capital as purely subjective possibility excluded from objective wealth and capital as active possibility of creating wealth or living source of labor. The paradox is, is that it is only use value for its non-owner who buys it to consume it, 
whereas it is above all exchange value for its owner who sells it to subsist. Um, so the paradox of labor power is that the use value of labor power belongs to capital. Um, it is as use value absolutely separated from value that labor power is creator of value. Uh, so if the, again, if the capital relation is truly contradictory in itself, this is because the contradiction traverses through and through the commodity that is labor power. It is the positive contradiction of use value and value only insofar as it is the contradiction between itself as non-capital or non-value and itself as use value of capital, which is to say use value of value. This contradiction is thus of a piece with the specificity of labor power, which is at the same time capital and non-capital. Um, so what Marx calls the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the positing of the contradiction um, is, which is latent in the commodity, um, is um, you know, carried out through labor power. Um, the contradiction, which is merely latent in the single commodity, is only posited within capital as a social relation. Uh, again, let me clarify on this, okay? The con Marx begins with the analysis of the single commodity, but the point is that a commodity is only what it is in relation to not only one, but to the totality of commodities, which is why it is the relations amongst commodities in a way that represents you know, the social relations amongst commodities um, that take the place of material relations amongst laborers or producers. Okay. Um, so the claim is that um, the, it's the latent contradictoriness inherent in the commodity as a relation of reflection that is, um, you know, fully, um, that becomes, you know, uh, explicit or that is, uh, you know, as Mark you knows, the Hegelian jargon is to say it becomes, you know, explicitly posited in um, um, when we, it becomes posited when we understand that labor power embodies the contradiction of the capitalist social relation. Um, then and only then the commodity labor power is as such only insofar as it is at the same time what it excludes from itself capital or in other words it is autonomous relative to value only insofar as it is at the same time posited by the latter as use value of value um, in other words its autonomy you know its independence relative to value or capital depends, is, is posited, is, is itself kind of conditioned and generated um, by its relation to capital or value, because it's nothing but the use value um, of, the use value of value. Um, okay, so this contradiction, this is a, a properly dialectical contradiction, okay? Um, which is to say that, um, a dialectical contradiction is, is, is where both, um, you know, something is, is itself by not being it itself um, and is not itself by being itself, okay? Um, so it's not merely an abstract or logical contradiction such as, you know, um, you know um, A and non-A, okay? Um, and this, you know, Dadon Lavey are making this point against, you know, um, readers of Marx like, you know, Coletti, who insist that, um, you know, Marx is confusing um, um, antimony and contradiction. Um, so they write, 
Labour power is indeed non-capital, non-A, but as such, it is assuredly something, and specifically the immediate corporeality devoid of all objectivity, just as the son is assuredly something outside his relations as a father. However, in its relation to capital, A, it is itself posited as use value of capital, which is to say determined as the possibility of producing wealth in the form of value, just as the son is son only through his relation to the father. Um, okay, so the point is being that, you know, um, uh, father and son are determinations of reflection. You can only be a father or a son in relation to, you know, to someone else. Um, but at the same time, if you abstract from that relation, you know, the son or the father, you know, has, you know, they have other characteristics or other properties, but those properties are disregarded or abstracted from in this um, reflexive relation. Um, um, now, the problem um, that Dardon Laval fasten upon at this stage is um, the problem of the transformation of money into capital, um, because the analysis of um, the commodity, a commodity um, expresses its value in relation to other commodities. Um, um, the money form arises as, you know, the, you know, the general equivalent which um, embodies, you know, the, um, the exchangeability, you know, the, the value of every other commodity. Um, but the money form itself is not capital, okay? So the problem is how do, you know, commodities and money are both um, instances of value, but neither is equivalent to capital. So if once you move from commodity um, to money, once you understand how the money form you know mediates you know the the relations amongst the totality of commodities, um, you still have to understand how um, a sum of commodities can constitute capital, um, and the labour power is required at this point because it's precisely the use of labor power and the extraction of surplus value um, in the capitalist use of labor power um, that um, you know, converts money into capital. Okay? Because the extraction, you know, um, Surplus value is um, the source of capital, um, and it's only by being, you know, um, reinvested in the production process um, that um, the process, you know, the MCM prime movement, the conversion of, um, you know, of a magnitude of value into a greater magnitude of value. Um, constitutes capital. Um, so the key, the um, the use of the commodity labor power is crucial for the conversion of money into capital. Um, but as Dardot Laval points out, there's both there's a paradox because Marx begins his analysis, you know, uh, of the commodity, uh, you know. He begins, you know, in the domain of the, uh, the circulation of commodities, and as he, you know, famously, the famous first line of capital is, um, you know, capital, you know, appears as an immense um, accumulation or an immense circulation of commodities. So that's why circulation, the circulation of commodities, is the starting point. But while capital, um, you know, um, appears first appears in the uh, in the sphere of circulation um, it's not it can't be generated 
from within the sphere of circulation. Um, there's the, um, you know, the, the um, we must enter into the hidden abode of production to explain, you know, how the, uh, you know, the use of labor power generates capital. Um, okay, so here's the, um, the problem as Marx sets it out. Capital cannot be born from circulation and it cannot not be born from it. It must at once be born and not be born from it. Capital must be born from circulation because the exchange of labor power for money falls within the sphere of circulation. If the capitalist, you know, the, the buying and selling of labor power occurs within the sphere of circulation. But, but both the commodity's use value and the realization of this use value are indifferent for the economic relation in the strict sense. Um, this first act corresponds to the independence or autonomy of labor power, to its status as non-capital. But at the same time, capital cannot be born from circulation because the capitalist use of labor power falls outside the sphere of circulation and occurs within the sphere of consumption. And thus the use of labor power's use value here constitutes a specific economic relation. Um, so um, there's, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a sense in which um, the, um, you, know, the, you know, the use, of um, labor power falls outside this, you know, it's internal to the sphere of circulation um, and is indifferent to the, um, the structure of the economic relations that Marx is um, trying to foreground in his analysis, but there's also a sense in which it constitutes a specific economic relation. Um, you know, it's this paradox that has to be clarified. Um, so Marx writes, the particular use value of this commodity and its effective realization as use value concern the economic relation, formal economic determinateness itself and falls under the purview of our study. Why? Because in a way, the use of labor power in the production of commodity is the source of surplus value um, and ultimately of the you know drives the accumulation of capital so it falls in a way it's at, it's at the uh, at the core of the um, you know the uh, the economic determinateness that marx is studying um, this second act corresponds to the moment of labor powers being posited or internal dependence in opposition to the moment of its autonomy or dependence. Anyway, the use of labor power is its, um, you know, it's positing by, you know, it's, it's positing by capital. Um, it's incorporation um, in the creation of value by capital. Um, this paradox falls from the internal contradictoriness of labor power. Capital must be born from within circulation insofar as labor power exists prior to exchange in the immediate corporeality or purely subjective existence of the labor and hence as non-capital or non-value. But at the same time, capital must not be born from within circulation insofar as the same use value is only use value for capital and is only realized as use value of capital within the labor process. So, okay, here's the paradox. The paradox is that um, capital can't be born um, within the sphere of circulation because the sphere of circulation already presupposes fully constituted capital. So you can't explain the emergence of capital from within the sphere of circulation because the sphere of circulation already presupposes you know the, the 
you know, a fully constituted capital. Um, um, but at the same time, it can't be explained um, outside it um, because without the use of labor power, capital can't, there's no creation of surplus value and therefore no capital. Um, I think that's the, the simplest way of, of putting the, uh, the paradox. Um, so that Daron Navarre pointing to, and actually Marx himself is signaling, um, you know, a paradoxical aspect of his attempt to deduce capital from the, um, the commodity and money. Um, And it's the contradictoriness of labor power that explains in a way why capital, um, you know, both um, can and cannot be born from within the sphere of circulation. Um, so only the elucidation of the contradiction in terms of labor power, which is not a mere appearance, makes it possible to overcome the actual appearance whereby value is a substance in process moving itself entering into a private relation to itself so to speak so here's here's what i think is going on it's that um in the sphere of circulation you know the conversion of money into capital within the sphere of circulation seems to happen as this um you know as through capital entering into a private relation to itself. So capital seems to be generating itself from itself. Okay. Um, so this is, this is the, the appearance. Okay. Um, the conversion of money into capital seems to, um, you know, happen miraculously. Why? Because um, labor power, you know, the, um, you know, Labor power can only contribute to the creation of um, surplus value by being posited by capital. In other words, as a component part, as an elementary component of capital. So the existence of labor power here already presupposes capital. So it can't explain, you know, the emergence of capital from money. Um, so the second point here um, um, follows from this um, observation. So Marx's analysis reveals that what lies beneath the appearance of capital's private self-relation is capital's relation to labor power as its opposite or non-capital, while also showing that the use value of this power is only realized in a production process governed by capital. Um, Okay, so in other words, capital can only um, constitute, you know, can only, um, you know, can only constitute itself through something that is its opposite, that is not it, through something that is that is at once, you know, it's a not it. Okay, so that that's the the paradox of capital is that capital is a is contradictory because it is itself and not itself. Um, and it's, um, it is constituted through something that is at once independent and dependent upon it. Um, so um, it's this, it's the, the apparent self-relation of capital that Marx um, wants to um, analyze and, and you know, to, to, to expose as a necessary appearance. Marx demonstrates that capital necessarily assumes the appearance of an immediate self-relation so long as one remains within the sphere of circulation. In other words, the conversion of M into M prime, you know, through the intermediary of C, you know, seems to be, um, you know, capital's, um, you know, private self-communion. Um, um, but this is, um, you know, uh, an objective appearance, 
you know, if one, so long as one remains merely at the, at the surface of capital, which is to say at the level of the sphere of circulation. Um, okay, so it's, the claim is that this, you know, capital's self-relation or its immediate self-relation is actually mediated by its relation to another, okay? To something that is and is not itself, okay? If one ignores this distinction between the appearance of a self-relation, which is that of capital considered from within the sphere of commodity circulation, and the reality of capital as a social relation, the, the relation between um, you know, the owners of the means of production and the owners of labor power, um, which, can only and which can only constitute itself on the basis of conditions that are external to circulation and only subsequently introduced in the exposition, what one cannot understand the equally contradictory formulation used by Marx in point two of chapter five. And hence, after having left behind the sphere of commodity circulation in order to explain the process of money's transformation in, into capital on the basis of the hidden abode of production. And Marx writes, the, in, this entire cycle, the transformation of money into capital takes place within the sphere of circulation and does not take place within it. It takes place within it because it has as its condition the sale of labor power on the market. And at the same time, it does not take place within it because this sale merely precedes the valorization process, the creation of surplus value, a process that for its part takes place in the sphere of production. Um, so Capital arises from the circulation of commodities as existence in act of the contradiction between value and use value, which remained enveloped within the single commodity. Um, and um, the points, just to go back to the, the previous slide, is that, that they're um, um, the reason why the, um, the transformation of money into capital both, you know, both does and does not take place within the sphere of circulation um, is because labor power is both um, internal and external to capital. It has this you know, equivocal, or, or rather, a labor power exists as a commodity, and it, it, you know, it's only, um, Labor power is, you know, actualized um, within um, the capitalist production process, and therefore serves the, um, you know, the creation of, of surplus value. Um, but the existence of labor power um, presupposes, um, you know, the existence of um, living labor. You know, laborers, and this is um, uh, a fact that cannot be wholly incorporated into capital. So, in other words, the split between living, you know, living and dead labor, between you know, um, you know, it's the living, it's the living laborer who is the bearer of la of labor power. And it's the fact that the living labor, you know, needs to reproduce her existence that makes the capitalist consumption of labor power possible, and therefore the creation of surplus value possible. So, so I, all this, you know, this complicated argument is simply trying to show that um, capital is, um, you know, capital is you know, seeks to um, posit its presuppositions, seeks to integrate its elementary, you know, presuppositions. Um, but in a way, the existence of the most essential of these presuppositions, i.e., you know, the availability of labor power, um, depends on something that capital cannot wholly incorporate within itself. Um, just to say the existence of living labor. Um, so this is why um, if commodities and money are elementary presuppositions for the formation of capital, 
can one affirm that insofar as the transformation of money into capital does not take place within them, but within the production process, commodities and money presuppose capital as a proper condition, i.e. are posited by it as its presuppositions. And here, um, Marx distinguishes between, um, or, or rather, the distinction between simple commodity production and capitalist commodity production is important. What is at stake is the immediacy of simple circulation as pure appearance, whose truth resides in its supersession by capital as relation of production. It is necessary to abstract from the determinations of production in examining the relation of circulation, because the commodity relation can only be posited as relation of production as capitalist relation of production. The proof of the specifically capitalist nature of commodity production is also proof of the historical specificity of capitalist production. Um, or as um, Dado Naval put it, it is precisely because it stamps all its products with the commodity form, including all those that feature as conditions for the production of a single commodity, that capital's only necessity is historically conditioned. Um, um, so um, why then start with the commodity and its circle? Why does Marx begin with the circulation of commodities? So either one starts from non-capitalist commodity production or from capitalist commodity production. And with the former, one could anticipate a correlation between the order of exposition and historical development insofar as non-capitalist commodity production furnishes an abstract model that encompasses pre-capitalist production. It's difficult to see how one could start from a non-capitalist mode of commodity production in which all products have the commodity form, since this is precisely the hallmark of the capitalist mode of production. So with the latter, the problem, and, with, I, and if one starts from capitalist commodity production, the transformation of commodities and money into capital is simply annulled. So um, it is to avoid this double pitfall that Marx chooses to begin not from non-capitalist commodity production or from capitalist commodity production, but from the commodity as it is immediately given in the sphere of circulation and thereby from this fear itself, reserving for a later stage of the exposition, the demonstration that the commodity only appears thus on the surface, on the basis of the separation of the producer from the means of production, thereby exposing within capitalist production, the internal condition for the given immediacy of commodity circulation. Um, but now Marx introduces two external conditions for the transformation of money into capital. Okay. The owner of money finds these conditions already there on the market. And this is the, you know, these conditions being that the free laborer is free in the double sense of being a free individual, you know, that's one condition, rather than a slave, and also in the sense of being free or deprived of the means of production necessary to realize our labor power. Um, and these two conditions are not logical presuppositions, but rather the results of a unique historical condition. Um, so Marx writes, capital's historical conditions of existence are in no way given with the mere circulation of commodities and money. Um, capital's historical conditions of existence are the conditions for the transformation of capital's elementary presuppositions, commodities and money, into capital. Or as Marx puts it, commodities and money are both elementary presuppositions of capital, but only develop into capital under certain conditions. Um, okay, so at this point, um, what's going on here is that um, you know the, Marx has to appeal to. Um, you know, in a way, the kind of the dialectical exposition of um, the structure of the commodity um, and how um, it's um, the structure, you know, begins as, um, you know, diversity and is consummated as contradiction and expresses the contradictoriness of the capitalist social relation. 
um, you know, the unfolding, the dialectical unfolding of this analysis, you know, is, you know, at a crucial moment, at a crucial moment in the process of explaining the conversion of money into capital, Marx brings in these two historical conditions, okay? You know, the, um, the, avail the availability on, uh, on the market of um, you know, individual wage laborers, okay? Now, the existence of individual wage laborers, or, you know, of, you know, free individuals, but who own only their labor power is, um, um, you know, historically conditioned, okay? That's, a, a, that's you know, a, it's a consequence of originary, you know, accumulation. Um, but this, you know, the, um, um, the intervention of these, of this, you know, extrinsic historical condition um, at this moment in the um, in, in the uh, in the analysis and the unfolding of um, the relationships between um, commodities, money, and capital is a problem, according to Dardot and Naval. Okay, um, and okay, I'll have more to say about why I think this is a curious, you know, objection, and or I'm not sure I, I completely because they've already told us. Um, in the first part of their account, um, that obviously capital, um, that, um, that the, uh, the logic of capital, capital's kind of, you know, um, speculative, um, you know, positing of its presuppositions is historically conditioned, okay? And that it's, um, there's a, you know, a purely um, a speculative positing of presuppositions um, which integrates um, historical factors, but these, the existence of these historical factors is not, you know, uh, can't be speculatively accounted for. Um, so um, it's not, so I think it's because they claim that Marx fails to articulate, you know, the dialectical and the historical aspects of his account. Okay, so here's what they say, that Marx did not manage to establish the wholly imminent necessity of the passage from the circulation of commodities to capital, and that as a result, the transformation of money into capital set out in volume one is not equivalent to a passage within capital is in our eyes undeniable. There is in this regard well and truly a failure of the dialectical method initiated in 1857. The development of diversity into contradiction is achieved only at the cost of a rupture within the dialectical process, a rupture introduced by the non-mediated eruption of two conditions external to the circulation of commodities. So this this implies that the necessity of money's transformation into capital is only ever a conditional necessity and in no way one that is conceptually made. It's a conditional necessity, it's historically conditioned because it depends on you know, the existence of um, you know, individual wage laborers. Um, um, the commodity posited as a, as a as a result of capital is nothing but the commodity as a result of the reproduction of capital. Um, so Marx will then write that the accumulation of capital presupposes surplus value. Okay, the, the um, in a way the circularity, the circle that is um, you know um, implicit in capital's self reproduction um, is you know needs to be. Um, um, run through in both directions, in both, you know, ascending and dis descending orders. Um, so in a way, what he's, you know, the it's the conversion of money into capital that is required to explain, you know, through the use of labor power that is, you know, required to explain the accumulation, capital as accumulation, as accumulation of surplus value. Um, okay, but once this, accumulation has been um, you know, identified, um, you can run backwards. The accumulation of capital presupposes surplus value, surplus value presupposes capitalist production, 
but the latter in turn presupposes the existence of large masses of capital and labor power in the hands of commodity producers. Um, so at this stage, you know, capital in reproducing itself, capital reproduces its own historical presuppositions. So initially, um, you know, the, uh, the historical condition, the availability of, um, you know, individual wage laborers is initially, you know, um, an exo you know, exogenous condition for capital's reproduction. Um, but it must be rendered endogenous, it must be incorporated. So in reproducing itself, capital must reproduce, um, you know, the wage relation and, um, you know, labor power. Um, so when surplus value is once more posited as capital, the externalities attendant upon its first appearance, i.e. the um, you know, the historical externality, the existence of, um, you know, individual wage laborers, um, these are banished. So Marx writes, the first time the presuppositions themselves appear as coming from outside circulation, as external presuppositions for the birth of capital, and hence as not emerging from its own internal essence and as not explained by it. And now these external presuppositions will appear as moments in the movement of capital itself, such that it has presupposed them as its own moments, regardless of the manner of their historical emergence. Um, so Marx writes, this is capitalist accumulation merely presents as a continuous process, what appears in original accumulation as a particular historical process, as a process of the birth of capital and as a passage from one mode of production to another. So in other words, the, the capitalist accumulation process um, must try to, you know, integrate um, the dynamic of originary accumulation, which is the separation of the laborers from the means of production or the producers from the means of production, which is the historical condition for the emergence of capital, um, which is why originary accumulation is not just a kind of, um, you know, a punctual event it doesn't just punctuate the, you know, the transition from feudalism to capitalism. It's also something that has to be repeated, you know, incorporated within the reproduction of capital or the, the, um, you know, the, the continual accumulation of capital. Um, um, I realize, okay, I've been um, going on for way too long. I'm sorry. Um, Surprised anyone's still listening. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna to try to really come to a close very soon. Um, um, yes, I'm gonna skip this. Okay, this is Dardona about simply emphasizing that you know the um, this is why you know the account of originary accumulation comes at the very end of volume one of Capital. Um, because it reveals a historical process of the production of the conditions that precede the existence of capital, and which in this sense pertain to its prehistory, um, as the condition for the process whereby capital posits these same conditions. So in other words, capital has to integrate its historical preconditions. It has to produce its historical preconditions. Um, um, okay, so I'll skip this. Um, Yes, okay, this is important. So there's a double move. At this point, you know, Dardo Naval identified this double movement, okay? Um, the double movement of achieved by the process of capital self-positing. A movement, okay, so in other words, they want to say that there's a, um, I take them, this to be their attempt to kind of explain the, you know, the, the junction of um, the, um, you know, the speculative capital's positing of its own, you know, presuppositions, and um, the the historical, um, the historic, you know, or the junction of um, the um, the two um, um, 
forms of uh, you know ideal speculation and historical speculation. Um, so on the one hand, there's um, there's a movement coming from a past situated, so to speak, beneath it, you know, beneath capital, uh, the, the historical precondition, you know, originary accumulation as you know, uh, you know, kind of this um, past event that is you know external to capital, um, but then capital interiorizes and, and must continually interiorize this, uh, um, you know, its own historical. Um, emergence, the events of its historical emergence, um, but in doing so, in conti continually interiorizing this, um, you know, this historical condition, it pushes beyond itself towards the future by actively tending right now towards its own abolition. Um, so as they put it, capital's interiorizing recapitulation of its own conditions of historical genesis is the movement of the constitution of the conditions for its own abolition. And these are not two movements succeeding one another, but one and the same movement acting right away in a double relation to the past and the future. And this is why um, you know, the circle of positing presupposing appear is a broken circle which cannot completely close upon itself. The circle of capital is a circle that cannot circle itself because it escapes from two sides, from its past as well as from its future. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I, should, I really should stop now. Um, okay. I, I was going to say to try to kind of reconnect this to the kind of class struggle, but maybe, you know, we could, you know, save this for the discussion. Um, what, what do you think, uh, Dan and uh, Sepide? Well, I think this was a very, a very uh, good talk, and it's definitely never, uh, never, uh, never too long. It's very, very interesting and uh, 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 illuminating. Yeah, Ray, you can take your time and finish your slide if you like. Well, I'll, I'll just okay try to reconnect all this stuff to the again to the, uh, the issue of class struggle. Okay. Um, class struggle is both the historical and the positive presupposition of capital, okay? Um, but just to see this distinguishes it between capitalism, systemic, and historical conditions of existence, Marx distinguishes between the two forms of violence associated with capitalism, you know, the economic and the extra-economic. The former indexes the silent compulsion of economic relations enforcing valorization, surplus value extraction and the latter the overt violence of originary accumulation which he describes in terms of spoliation fraud theft usurpation you know these non-economic categories so marx writes okay this is at the end of um, you know capital volume one the spoliation of the church's property the fraudulent alienation of the state domains the theft of the common lands the usurpation of feudal and clan property and its transformation into modern private property under circumstances of ruthless terrorism. All these things were just so many idyllic methods of original accumulation. So, sarcastically kind of alluding to the idyllic accounts of um, you know, the emergence of capital in you know, um, classical political economy. Um, um, but then Marx says something um, that um, Dadon of I'll take to be very, um, you know, worrying, or rather, kind of that, you know, or rather, what they, they see as kind of pointing to a tension in his account of class struggle. Okay, um, and I'll just read out. I won't read out this whole. Um, this whole. I'll just read out. You know, a couple of sentences. The advance of capitalist production develops a working class which, by education, tradition, and habit, looks upon the requirements of that mode of production as self-evident natural laws. Thus, the organization of the capitalist process of production, once it is fully developed, breaks down all resistance. Okay. Um, and he, he then talks about the silent compulsion of economic relations uh, that sets the seal on the domination of the capitalist over the worker. Direct extra e economic forces still, of course, used, but only in exceptional cases. In the ordinary run of things, the worker can be left to the natural laws of production. It is possible to rely on his dependence on capital. Um, so, um, 
class struggle, again, is both exogenous and endogenous to capital. On the one hand, class struggle is capital's exogenous historical condition, according to Gardot and Nobel's initial accounts. But on the other hand, it is its endogenous economic condition. Um, because it's the, you know, the class relation, the separation of the producers from the means of production is what, you know, is the condition for, for, for valorization, you know. Um, so does the claim that capital's economic violence breaks down all resistance reduce class struggle to capital's unilateral domination of labor? Because the contradiction inherent in labor power as capital and non-capital is constitutive of capital, capital's continual expropriation of labor from the means of production is also its appropriation as labor power. It's positing as capital's necessary presupposition. Or Marx puts it, you know, as the chosen people bore in their features the sign that they were the property of Jehovah, so the division of labor brands the manufacturing worker as a property of capital. Um, um, and it's, Dardot Laval glossing this, you know, this quotation, uh, right? If the wage laborer belongs to capital because her life depends upon capital, if she is already a moment, an aspect of capital, its being is shaped by the use capital makes of its labor, by the organization of production which brands into its flesh increasingly mutilating characteristics. Um, so um, this means that capital's creation of its own technical foundation in the form of the system of machinery and the completion of labor's real subsumption under capital. Um, now, capital's creation of its own technical foundation in the form of the system of machinery and the completion of labor's real subsumption under capital are two sides of one and the same irresistible process. And in this regard, labor struggles, labor struggles are economic struggles for the survival of labor, um, but not for the destruction of capital. Um, the extraction of absolute surplus value under the formal subsumption of labor makes way for the extraction of relative surplus value once capital has completely taken over the labor process and achieved the real subsumption of labor. And the struggles limiting the working day, as Marx himself shows in Capital, can, they, they contribute to the modification of the labor process in order to increase productivity. In other words, the struggles over the, you know, by shortening the, uh, the working day, um, you simply kind of provide the capitalists with an opportunity to intensify, um, you know, the extraction of surplus value, okay, to find new, new, new ways um, to, um, you know, to generate, um, you know, surplus labor from necessary labor, okay. So in other words, no longer, you know, the um, exploitation is no longer extensive, but it becomes intensive. Um, th this increase in productivity is not intended to diminish labor time, but to diminish the labor time necessary to produce the value of the commodities consumed by laborers and thereby to lower the value of labor power. Um, if the socialization of labor engendered by the capitalist production process creates the condition for the eventual overcoming of capital, the global proletariat, that's as Marx insists, okay, um, um, it's not considered for itself in, in relation to the possibilities for struggle available to laborers within the labor process. So in other words, Marx's account says that the kind of, um, you know, the, uh, the, the induction of the entire human population into the proletariat, you know, the, the reduction of um, all of humanity to the status of bearers of labor power, um, will you know generate the conditions for you know um, for revolution um but not um you know the the struggles you know not the um not any kind of struggle economic struggle between labor and capital um it's precisely to the extent that labor struggles ultimately facilitate and augment the extraction of relative surplus values that they intensify the contradictions and antagonism to breaking point. And Marx's accounts, and Dardot Laval are, are kind of emphasizing, you know, that on um, Marx's accounts, um, it's, Marx is well aware of this. Marx kind of, you know, um, underlines the extent to which 
a shortening of the working day, all these kinds of um, these gains, the gains made by um, wage labor vis-a-vis -vis capital are actually, um, actually contribute to the intensification of exploitation um, and the intensification of the contradiction, you know, of the, uh, which is, you know, intrinsic to, to the capitalist social relation. So that, and this is what will, you know, ultimately kind of, uh, you know, sharpen the contradiction to breaking points. Um, um, and, this, and this is a quotation from Marx where he says exactly this. Um, I'm not going to read the whole the whole thing. Um, um, it's, well, I'll just read the last two sentences. Um, by destroying both the ancient and the transitional forms behind which the dominion of capital is still partially hidden and replacing them with a dominion which is direct and unconcealed, um, capital also generalizes um, the direct struggle against its rule. Um, and finally, by maturing the material conditions and the social combination of the process of production, it matures the contradictions and antagonisms of the capitalist form of that process and thereby ripens both the elements for forming a new society and the forces tending towards the overthrow of the old one. On this account, and it, it's Marx's account in capital, um, according to Dardo and Laval, revolutionary transformation is not the result of labor's victory, but of capital's self-destruction. So then the class struggle is subservient to the unconscious and, invol and involuntary movement of the negation of negation or the expropriation of the expropriators. It is an auxiliary to an objective historical process. Um, so the point is that what that one of our are pointing out that there's a fundamental, this is the fundamental tension that they see in Marx's work. So on the one hand, the claim that men make, you know, humans make their own history, um, but not in conditions of their own choosing, and that capital is, you know, the uh, you know the alienated you know, manifestation of human productive capacities, you know, um, and on the other hand, that um, um, you know the class struggle. So, you know, capital is the the result of a class struggle, um, which. Um, Manifested the active, you know, the active side of um, human activity or human, you know, human social production. Um, but now, capital, in a way, um, restructures, you know, or in a way, integrates the class struggle to such an extent uh, that this struggle becomes a passive kind of um, reflection of capital's you know own active expansive dynamic okay um and um it seems that the um at least that uh well it's not obvious how you can reconcile these um you know you can reconcile the claim about um the, the um you know the irreducibility of the effective presuppositions you know human practical um, activity as, uh, you know, the, the making, the constant, you know, production of history and the claim that the next, um, you know, the decisive historical transformation from capitalism to communism in a way will not be the result of, um, you know, human activity, but of the, um, you know, the, um, the self-destruction of the um, the objective contradiction generated, you know, um, but no longer governed by that activity. Um, and you know what I want to say is that in there, so they claim that you know what Marx calls communism is in fact an ideal. It's an attempt to reconcile this the um, you know the tension between these incompatible. Um, conceptions of, of class struggle, um, the subjective and the objective. There's a subjective aspect, subjective historical aspect of class struggle and an objective economic aspect. Um, and Marx, you know, wants to or claims to be able to reconcile them, but in fact, um, his analysis of capital and the logic of his analysis of capital is purely objective. 
So in other words, it's almost as if there's, a, there's an objective reconciliation of the subjective and of the objective, which is why they, they think it's an idealist, he has to resort to an idealist kind of resolution um, of the antagonism between the two, um, between the two logics. Okay, and I'll just, I'll just stop, I'll just stop there. Thanks for your patience. Um, Okay, thank you, Ray. This was a, 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 a very good talk today. Um, I think now uh, we can stop the share uh, of the screen and we can go uh, into questions. Okay. And it's how long you want to go. Um, but definitely we have time and to us this, 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 this is very, very interesting. Now, as a reminder, it's good to have the cameras on so we see who we are, even if you don't plan to ask questions. It's good to have the, the camera on so we see who we are. <laughs> if you do want to ask a question, please, um, um, you, are, you are definitely free to unmute and ask the question. You can use the raise hand feature just as a way to uh, uh, establish a sequence on what the next, next questions would be. Um, I think uh, Evrim was the first to raise hand. So Evrim, please feel, feel free to unmute and um, ask, ask, ask a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask a question about the relationship between uh, presupposition and positive. Uh, so it, it reminds me of your reading of Lavelle, um, especially uh, in your PhD thesis, for example, you are uh, making use of the operation of dualysis, which separates uh, presupposition and positing and so that so that the real is presupposed without being posited and uh, posited without being presupposed and uh, you are proposing to supplement the uh, revolutionary subjectivity uh, with a prosthesis uh, or, or with an alien subject in order to effectuates this uh, effectuate this separation of presupposition and positing and uh, and this is necessary because the logic of capital already depends on the intrication of uh, presupposition and positing um, so so I'm thinking if um, I, I'm thinking of how, how how what you are seeing here connects to that and how uh how the se separation of presupposition and positing um is effectuated um, in, in your reading here or, or are you still trying to to do that um okay well so this i mean i'm simply kind of um you know here just reconstructing um you know Dardon Laval's account, um, but obviously it's one, you know, I'm, I find it very, very interesting because it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's very close to my own, to things I'm, I was, you know, I've been interested in for a while. Um, and the key, I think, is that they, you know, as they, as they see it, you know, idealism, by which they mean kind of, you know, Hegelianism, is um, you know an attempt you know to to bring you know um, to distinguish positing and presupposing you know but ultimately to kind of to bring to bring them together um, as you know mediation and immediacy um, but this um, they can only be brought together in when, you know, bringing them together results in a kind of an immediate self-relation, okay? And, oh, oh, no, it's, it's, the example that Dardon Laval always give is um, the, the opening of Hegel's Science of Logic, which is, you know, where there's no distinction between, um, you know, um, subject and object or between, you know, thinking and what is thought. Um, and this point of coincidence between thinking and being, um, where you know you open with you know being pure being without any further determination, is this 
kind of, um, you know, this simple self-relation, this simple self-relation, which is, um, you know, which is speculative, although its speculative form will only be, you know, explicated, you know, in, you know, in, in the logic of essence. So, um, in the, um, so they credit Marx with understanding, with trying to break out of this logic, so in a way, Marx is neither, he doesn't want to be an idealist, but he doesn't want to be an empiricist, okay? So the, um, the empiricist presupposes, you know, without understanding how every presupposition implies, you know, a positing or a position. Um, and the, uh, the subjective idealist merely, um, you know, posits um, without, you know, um, you know, and, but, you know, by autonomizing positing, turns positing itself into a presupposition. And then you get this, you know, the, the, the subject object identity that Hegel thinks is, um, is a problem. You can't just, you know, that the shot fired from the pistol, if you start with the indifference of subject and object, you know, you can't, um, you know, you can never, um, you know, reach, um, you know, the, the, you can't, you know, recover the kind of the, uh, the richness of determination of the concrete. You can never, you're still thinking abstractly. You're still kind of, um, still thinking just communing with itself. Um, so, on Dardot Naval's account, it's kind of Marx kind of finds a solution in this account of the effect of presupposition, which is that, you know, you can't, um, there's something that has to be presupposed. Well, what is presupposed is, you know, the, in a way, is this um, activity, this kind of, you know, praxis, okay, this, this productive activity, which is always um, historically uh, concrete and determinate, okay? So the point is that you begin with the analysis of capital, Okay, to begin with the analysis of a, of a social formation, you have to um, understand it as, um, in a way, the result of an effect of presuppositions, but also as having um, a rich, complex internal structure, um, which can be simply deduced from uh, the activity of, um, from this practical, from praxis, okay? So the point is that even if every kind of, um, you know, concrete, um, you know, historical datum is the, the result of, you know, practical activity, its, uh, its structure can't be, um, you know, there's no kind of transitivity from the structure of that activity to the, you know, to the, uh, the, uh, the internal characteristics of that structure. So that's why you have to find a way um, to analyze the structure and then to, to reconnect it to that kind of um, productive activity. So they think this is Marx's great, you know, kind of, um, you know, breakthrough, his great theoretical breakthrough. Um, but to go back to the example that, you know, you mentioned, you know, Larell, Larell, you know, tries to separate those two things, but in a way, um, the separation of those two things is carried out on the basis of, you know, what he calls this, you know, radical imminence, you know, this, you know, this, um, what is given without givenness, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this is, is, is the problem there is that this is itself never, um, um, you know, it's, it is kind of, uh, um, it's not dialectical, it's not kind of, it's not the, the result of a speculative kind of, you know, reflection, it's not, it's not of the order of determinate reflection, um, but at the same time, it's, it can only, um, you know, you can only put it into effect to think something by, you know, um, using a material, you know, you know, there has to be something else um, that, um, you know, occasions 
um, the uh, you know the the production of a subject, um, and that's something for Laruel is you know philosophy as a world. So the problem is that Laruel, um, you know, he staves off speculation, you know, and empiricism, but at, at, at the price of an even of a kind of a punitive level of, of abstraction, because this you know this reel of the last instance um is you know um it's not that he you know he can explain how it's um um you can you know you can it can be effectuated in thinking but the thinking um it doesn't really allow you to um to grasp any kind of um, um the way in which it, it gives you access to what is concrete is through uh, the medium through the element of philosophical form and the problem in laruel is that there's a i think that there is a kind of a disavowed dependence between you know the indivisibility of this real of the last sentence of this radical eminence on the one hand and his insistence that the basic gesture of philosophy is division okay and so he he has division and indivision but he doesn't want to dialectically articulate them but the but but indivision only gives rise to um to thought you can only think on the basis of indivision um by using division okay and that's um it's not that I think Laruel is kind of, you know, inconsistent, or it's just that there's like the consistency he achieves that ultimately is still very formal and seems to be kind of um, comparatively impoverished and in a way doesn't, um, you know, gives you very little traction on, um, you know, kind of uh, the kinds of phenomena and the kinds of social realities that Marx was interested in dealing with. And that's why you know, Laruel's book on Marx is so curiously kind of um, un unsatisfying, at least, at least to me. Um, so yeah, there is a connection, but I think that the way, so the way in which if, if uh, Dardon Laval are right, and I think that, you know, they are right that this is what Marx was, was trying to do, then his account of um, effective presuppositions is, um, you know, a, a real breakthrough and an, an immense philosophical kind of advance. Um, but then it immediately, um, you know, entails the critique of political economy, because that's how you um, understand. It's through the critique of political economy that you you you. Um, you know, you know, um, or you objectify the um, the concrete social historical, um, you know, situation, um, which is you know um, within which you find yourself. You know, which is the, the starting point. Um, so, okay, so so yes, there is. Um, I think ultimately Marx's account, um, if it's you know coherent, would be an advance over both you know Hegel and Laruel. It's an alternative to Hegel and Laruel. You know, it's neither um, you know speculative nor is it kind of um, this. Uh, you know, axiomatic in this, as Laruel's is, um, and it gives you real traction upon, um, you know, the uh, um, upon the concrete, but not 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 by fetishizing an abstract concretion, not a phenomenological concretion, but actually, it's um, the way in which Marx uh, reconstructs the nature of the concrete is, uh, you know, it's. Um, it's informed by the you know the Hegelian critique of empiricism, um, but it 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 doesn't kind of um, it breaks free of the circuit of speculation, 
Um, and that's, you know, incredibly um, important. But the, the question, what Dardon Laval's question or their critical interrogation is that, does it not ultimately, even if he initially breaks free, doesn't he end up reconstituting this, um, this kind of um, idealist, the coincidence of subject and object in um, this, in, in the figure of communism? That's, the, that's their critique. Their critique is that um, he breaks with Hegel and then unwittingly reproduces the Hegelian fusion of subjective and objective with the with communism and that, that and that's what they find you know problematic um great thank you ray and let's let's go next to uh to Afrika. thank you uh, uh for me uh, the most um, uh complex part is uh, distinguishing between um, dialectical and historical part of uh, Marxian uh, analysis, and uh, I'm I'm a reader of uh, phenomenology of spirit, and I uh, started to read it uh, recently. Uh, not not for long, I read it, but uh, uh, as I understand. Um, uh, Heckel's uh, thought is uh, about um, his uh, his dialectics is about uh, the thought process of the human and self. And when I understand it that way, for me it's very simple to uh, to imagine uh, what is object, what is subject, uh, and what is a distinction. Like uh, uh, the object is something that I'm thinking about, and uh, subject is a process, and they are uh, interchangeable uh, in the <laughs> whole process itself. Uh, then, uh, then I'm I can uh, imagine simply uh, that uh, society is a, uh, is a um, result is a result of the thinking process too. And things like class, like class itself, uh, in that perspective becomes a subject which is uh, born in that process of uh, uh, the society thinking. And uh, then my question is uh, why uh, there are, why is there, in the first place, uh, there must be two perspectives, dialectical and, and historical. Why isn't it just one dialectical mm, kind of logic which uh, uh, goes through um, different levels? Ah, okay, so, um, so you're asking why must there be a distinction between the dialectical and historical uh, dimension? Um, because, okay, and here, I, I think um, if, um, at the core of dialectics is this speculative logic, according to, you know, um, Dardot and Laval. Um, and that means that if you think, um, um, if you think that history is dialectical or that there's a kind of a, a, a dialectical structure to history, um, then, well, that, that structure cannot but be um, conceptual. So um, you have to justify this claim that history has a dialectical structure. Um, and Marx, you know, begins, you know, his, you know, various criticisms of, of Hegel are, um, he thinks that um, um, history is, um, what governs history is this uh, process of material production and reproduction. Um, and he refuses, um, the 
you know, I think he rejects the claim that um, there's um, that the, if, if there's a logic at work in history, um, it's not dialectical. Okay, it's this. Um, it'll be another. It's a logic of antagonism and a logic of struggle. Um, but um, this antagonism and this struggle cannot be dialectically encapsulated. Uh, and why? Because dialectic means something very specific. It means something precise. And it's not just about if you understand kind of uh, you know, what it means for something, to, for a process to be dialectical, well, it has to have this, this structure and, and you know, it has to have this kind of, uh, you know, this movement, you know, at least which involves these, uh, you know, certainly the, the transition from um, this part, you know, from difference, you know, to opposition to contradiction. Um, and, you know, contradictions um, require conceptual determinations. Um, so, I mean, look, um, so, on the one hand, you know, it seems plausible to assume that Marx, well, Marx thinks that um, capital has a dialectical structure. Um, history doesn't have a dialectical structure. Capital has a dialectical structure because it is um, generated by I was going to say, I'm changing my mind about my answer. Um, um, actually, it's not clear. It's, I'm actually not sure that it's possible to claim on the one hand that um, capital has a dialectical structure, but history doesn't, um, because capital is, um, however complicated and um, you know, difficult to objectify, it's still the product of human activity and human social relations. Um, and even if it ends up kind of controlling and governing those social relations, it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't, um, its structure is not purely um, logical. Why? Because it doesn't unfold within the order of the concept. This is the whole question is Marx thinks you need a concept of capital to understand capital. But then what is the relationship between the concept of capital and the phenomenon capital? Um, now, there are some Marxists who think, well, you have to be Hegelian and you just say, well, there has to be, you can only think this object by, you know, um, in a way, you know, reproducing, be, you know, by being confident that the structure of thinking can limb the structure of the object, okay? Uh, and, but then if you think that, then you're Hegelian. Um, and, you know, it's then simply, then Marx is a Hegelian and he's simply, um, in a way, extended Hegelianism um, you know, or rectified Hegelianism by identifying capital um, as, um, in a way, as this, uh, you know, as this social structure which can't be, um, you know, which can't be understood using the resources that, you know, Hegel himself, for instance, tried to use in his um, philosophy of right and he, you know so in other words it can't you know simply kind of um, um, which is to say that for for you know according to to Marx um, social structures are not merely you know objectifications of spirit okay and so he insists that spirit is the manifestation of 
human social life and human social life is not the manifestation of spirit so he insists that there's something about um, practical productive activity um, that unfolds you know that operates behind the back of spirits um, you know, that there's a you know that there's a, a material unconscious which um, is not like the uh, the formal unconscious of spiritual self-consciousness okay there's at the in the phenomenology there are things that you know spirits um there are um, spirits you know misrecognizes itself misunderstands itself uh, and it's only you know gradually that it kind of you know begins to kind of that it's you know becomes transparent to itself on the standard reconstruction but marx at least seems to want to say that there's something about social practice that is um, opaque to self-consciousness that cannot be simply um, you know, recaptured from the vantage point of self-consciousness. So that means that the kind of the, the coincidence of um, you know, thought and object, that means that you know, the, the concept of capital, the congruence between the concept of capital and the phenomenon capital, um, can't be enveloped within the ambit of self-consciousness. Um, and then this is where, you know, Marx's kind of these methodological remarks about kind of reconstructing the concrete in thought that you must, um, precisely capital is not something that is, it's not an object of, it's not intellectually intuitable, but neither is it simply empirically perceptible. So therefore you must try to kind of, you know, to reconstruct it in thought, but then, um, you know, the way in which you reconstruct it in thought, um, you know, is somehow, you know, must be conditioned by its, um, you know, its real structure. Um, you know, what is, um, what is concrete in thought, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the fully fledged, you know, concrete conceptual development of the object of thought must somehow um, must somehow correspond to what is, you know, concrete in reality. Um, but there's no kind of um, you know straightforward. Um, but the correspondence is not. Um, I don't know. It's not the nature of that correspondence is what is is what is kind of um, mysterious, or at least it's mysterious to me. Um, so um, that's why. Okay. So, what point am I trying to make? Is the point is that um, um, On the one hand, it's tempting to say um, that the reason why, for instance, capital can be contradictory, and you know, and contradiction is a you know a speculative category, is because it's generated in and through human activity, which must have some kind of you know which must have a um, a conceptual underside, even if it is you know. Um, unconscious okay or not self-conscious um okay but then if that's the case then it's not clear why this conceptual what distinguishes this the conceptual underbelly um of social activity you know which generates the contradiction of capital of marx's account from the from what you know the um from what is um from the formal unconscious of uh, of spirit from what you know from whatever self-consciousness has not you know whatever dimension of itself self-consciousness has not yet fully um you know recuperated or grasped um so and 
you know, to be perfectly honest, I think I don't have a good answer to this because I think, you know, I think I know what the, sometimes I think I know what the answer is supposed to be. And I think I know what one should say from a Marxian perspective. Um, but then um, it becomes difficult. Um, you know, what, what is it, you know, what, um, what can account for the contradictoriness of capital um, if not it's if its structure is not conceptual um, and that, I, okay then here I know it depends what you mean by conceptual and um, the point is that uh, you know Hegel's account of the conceptual is you know not at all that of um, not not only is it not psychological but it's not simply kind of reducible to um, you know what can be um, you know grasped through a concept is not simply you know whatever can be you know has a predicative function or whatever can be kind of um, you know understood you know using the resources of of um, of language. Um, So yeah, so I, um, I mean, look, it's obvious that Marx rejects a kind of a, a kind of a, the version of Hegel that says that there is reason in history, and the reason that is unfolding in history is the coming to self consciousness of spirits. Okay, is is is, is um, you know spirits coming to grasp its own essential freedom. Um, because Marx wants to say that kind of um, um, you know spirit might be spiritual self consciousness might be a manifestation of certain aspects of human social activity, but it's a mistake to think that all um, all the dimensions of those activities can be um, recapitulated within the medium of spirit, and but then I don't know exactly you know. Um, I mean, here the Hegelian would say, well, how, you know, why? Why not? Okay. And this is what um, I actually don't know. I don't have an answer. Um, so, yeah, this is, it's, your question is, ve is very simple, but actually it's incredibly, I find it incredibly difficult to answer. Um, all I know is that Marx wants to articulate the dialectical and the historical. He thinks that fusing them is not permissible. If you simply fuse them, you're a kind of speculative idealist in, in a bad way. Um, but, you know, it's impossible to wholly, you know, even the, you know, the, the concept of history and the category of history is itself obviously conceptual. So in making the distinction, you're already articulating, you know, dialectics and history. Um, and, you have to give some kind of, um, you know, even if history is not kind of, um, even if there's no kind of isomorphy of history and speculative dialectics, then perhaps their articulation could be dialectical. Um, and I think that that's what, you know, Marx ultimately he thinks that um, when he says, look, he says, um, um, you know, the, uh, the anatomy, that famous line, you know, the anatomy of man is the key to the anatomy of the ape. He, he's saying that there is only, that the only, um, you know, historical movement, historically, historical development can only be retrospectively constructed. So in other words, you, you have to understand, you know, the, uh, the present, to understand, you know, how it was, uh, how it came to be. Um, and if that's Hegel's account of history, and it, I think that that is also kind of a Hegelian thought, you know, the uh, philosophy is, you know, the comprehension of its own time and so on, but it always, always comes after the fact, after the event, then maybe um, Marx is Hegelian um, and the claim about, you know, you know, Marx doesn't think that modes of production can be, you know, simply kind of, you know, 
threaded next to one another in a linear sequence, which is why he thinks that there's the, the, these ruptures and discontinuities between them. But then these, um, you know, the, the violence of, um, you know, originary accumulation, for instance, which punctuates and separates, you know, feudalism from capitalism, he says, the, yeah, is the violence of originary accumulation dialectical or not? That would be the, the issue. I mean, the, the claim is that if you kind of, um, if there is reason in history, then, then there is still kind of, um, you know, every historical atrocity and crime must be kind of rationally recuperable. And famously, this is what like, you know, a materialist is supposed to reject. <laughs> Um, but um, but but Hegel is you know I think he Hegel is often caricatured as a kind of you know someone who thinks that um, you know the um, affirming reason in history is has a you know has, is has a cons you know consolatory function but actually it might be terrible you know maybe admitting that there is reason in history it might be an appalling admission, actually. Everyone thinks that it's a kind of, uh, it's saying something that is, you know, consolatory and that it's supposed to get me. But maybe having to admit that there is reason in history is admit that there's, you know, the, the monstrosity of, of reason or the atrocity of reason. Um, because then it, it, it depends on whether you think reason is all about reconciliation or not. And um, again, that's, you know, there's a caricature of Hegel that says, you know that it is but it's it's not so clear it's not so clear okay so yeah so this is you know i really don't know yes the more i think about these questions the less sure i am of the answers actually so um that's the best i can do i'm afraid thanks a lot um, it helped okay <clears throat> great thank you ray um well i, I see a uh, raise hand from a participant Called called the uh, called the user. Um, Sorry, my uh, name is Jai. I I don't know how to change that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, actually same question more or less, but I want to elaborate maybe from that perspective when you say Marxist failure, which you know uh, dialectic wasn't supportive enough to explain arisal of capitalism and a rupture needed and you know uh, was this rupture historically i mean is it i want to really put a label on it like you know colonialism slavery which is never mentioned in the primitive accumulation at all you know if you go to opening of the first volume there, there is this story, you know, how countryside is, you know, people pushed into the cities and, you know, how, to so speak, uh, living labor broke into the potentiality to be part of the capital. I mean, can you elaborate on the rupture? I mean, is there a, so that makes Marx completely anti-Hegelian in some ways, which is quite a novelty, if you think. Uh, can you say more about the rupture? What is rupture? I mean, what is rupture in that thing uh, that Marx experienced this trauma, so to speak, but never talked about? Well, uh, sure. Um, OK, let, let me try and answer. So first, um, yes, so it's. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I think I wrote, you know, Marx's failure in inverted commas, because that's, you know, that's, Dardot and Laval call it a failure. And what they're referring to is the fact that in the, um, you know, the dialectical exposition of the, um, the conversion of money into capital, um, you need at, at one point, you know, he needs to, all of a sudden he brings in the, um, 
the existence of you know the the free laborer you know the individual um, you know the individual um, bearer of labor power who is free formally free um, to sell their labor um, on the market to sell their labor to the capitalist um, but who's also kind of you know who's been dispossessed of you know the means of production. So they say that this is a this is a historical condition um, for the capitalists' um, conversion of you know um, for the for the process of you know the conversion of money into capital, but it's not a dialectical um, you know it's a, it's a, it's not a kind of it's not strictly dialectical. In other words, it's not dialectical in the, in the sense of um, it's it's not governed by the logic of reflection. Okay, because here when they, when when they're talking about the dialectical nature of Marx's analysis of the commodity, they mean dialectical in this very kind of specific sense of governed by the logic of reflection, you know, and uh, you know the articulation of you know relation to self through another, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So they say that all of a sudden, um, with the you know the introduction of you know the free wage labor you know you have this you're bringing in a historical condition and it's not that they um now you know it, it, they're saying that whose um whose role in this at this particular juncture and this particular phase of the dialectical analysis is not properly explained okay so they're saying that there's um, now, so I think that it's a bit of an overstatement to call it a failure, and I'm actually not sure why they call it a failure, um, because, um, but they simply say that um, here, this is a, this is a factor in the, uh, the process of the conversion of money into capital, which is not, you know, uh, governed by this, you know, speculative logic. Um, um, now, of course, it makes sense. Uh, so, so then the question is, well, but look, but haven't they themselves been saying that Marx is trying to articulate, you know, the the speculative and the historical, uh, you know, or the uh, you know the positing of presuppositions and these effective presuppositions, and obviously the availability of uh, you know free of um, you know um, wage labor is um, the result of an effective presupposition. It's a historical consequence. Um, it's a consequence of the dispossession uh, of the producers um, um, you know, from the means of production. Um, and they think that, you know, although you know, Marx is always, you know, he insists that that's, I mean, that's at the core of the capital relation. The capital relation is not, is, you know, is a result of this dispossession, originally accumulation. Um, but they're saying that it doesn't, um, that, um, you know, polar opposition between labor and capital, between the proprietors of the means of production and the, and the proprietors of labor power, is not itself um, doesn't doesn't embody the contradiction that they think Marx is analyzing and unpacking um, at this stage of his account. Um, and when you mention in the kind of original accumulation, he doesn't mention. It's true that he's talking about the enclosure and he's talking about you know the. Um, you know the, the the enclosure of the commons and the um, you know the the forced kind of um, um, you know expulsion of of kind of you know farmers tenant farmers etc from their land and their kind of relocation to kind of you know to, to towns and cities, um, but that but he does and so but even. You know, he may not mention colonialism and imperialism there, but he, he mentions them shortly after. Okay, I'm not, I'd have to reread, but there are several junctures towards the, the end of you know volume one and after the, the discussion of origin and accumulation where he mentions colonialism 
as simply a kind of an extension of this of the process of dispossession. Um, so it's clear that originary accumulation, even if it starts locally with the uh, the expropriation of you know um, local inhabitants or whatever, it will proceed. You know, it will kind of you know um, expand outwards, and as the um, you know as capital, you know, the expansion of the uh, of the uh, of the capitalist market entails the kind of the um, you know the 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 colonization and the expropriation of um, um, of peoples everywhere basically. So it seems that it's um, it's indissociable from the uh, the process of you know original accumulation. Um, so. Yes, so this, so in that regard, yeah, I mean, um, so I don't think that there's a kind of, um, you know, I think you can draw a line from, you know, clearances within, uh, in, in Europe, what happened in Europe to, you know, what happens, you know, um, subsequently all over the world. Um, it's, it actually also happens the other way. I mean, in a, in a sense, because the, you know, the colonization of, you know, Africa and America also facilitated the, um, you know, or at least it seems to have facilitated the uh, the development of capital, you know, in in Europe, um, you know, in England, France, Holland, etc. Um, I don't know enough about this, but like it's um, it seems that um, the the process of dispossession doesn't need to be, um, you know, it doesn't need to start. Um, first of all, it's intrinsic to capital, and secondly, it doesn't need to kind of, you know, start locally and expand outwardly. It could also kind of, you know, um, be, you know, correlate, you know, the uh, the local, you know, you know, something that is, you know, a local kind of, you know, area and something, you know, much further away. So. Um, and then, but I'm not sure why you think this doesn't make Marx Hegelian. Um, I mean, the whole, or could you say more about why you think it's, um, you know, this seems to kind of ignore Marx as the Hegelian dimension of Marx's thoughts, or? I think uh, you, you, uh, you establish a parallel between what happened, you know, one uh, enables labor force to move, uh, to freely move, which is mm -hmm. internal to European sphere, but the other one is the enslavement, the opposite. It moves into the opposite direction uh, and incomparably bigger amounts to the European sphere. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you multiply the labor force when it comes to, say, Brazil and, you know, Caribbean, etc., and, and colonialism likewise, where uh, capital to its own, uh, compared to its own development in Europe, which is breaking the feudal rules, acts on opposite, which is, I would say, uh, uh, contra, uh, a contradiction, mm -hmm. uh, in, irreconcilable, in, and this is very anti-Hegelian because that's like uh, Hegelian Marx sees that as a sort of uh, one-way direction towards uh, capital uh, subsuming the previous relations of pro reproduction, whereas in when we go to, you know, India, China, or wherever, we see the opposite move. Capital reinforces the previously held. Uh, ah, well, okay. <laughs> you see what I mean? Like there, there is this problem, and yet sort of it develops on, on the back of that. On, on ah, yeah, but but even within Europe, this and actually. Um, Marx actually says, um, 
he says at several kind of several places, he says, first of all, capitalism is, um, you know, okay, it's this fundamental kind of social relation, but it can happily coexist with, um, you know, pre-capitalist, you know, with all sorts of kind of, you know, pre-capitalist social strata. Okay, so it's, a, it's in other words, it's a mistake, even in Europe, for instance, in Germany, in 19th century Germany, you know, 19th century Germany is still largely a kind of a feudal in its structure and its institutions, but that doesn't prevent capital from taking hold. So in other words, it's a mistake, I think, to think that capital is, um, you know, immediately kind of, you know, kind of, that it's all or nothing, that, you know, a society is, um, you know, either, you know, capitalist or not capitalist, as if because capitalist doesn't immediately, the capitalist mode of production doesn't translate into a set of, um, you know, you know, a specifiable set of civil or political institutions. So for instance, bourgeois civil society, you know, in one sense is exempt, you know, seems to kind of um, be the result of um, capitalist social relations, but capitalism can exist with, um, you know, with feudal relations as well. It just needs certain kind of, um, um, it can establish itself in a society whose social relations are, are not bourgeois, there hasn't been a bourgeois revolution, um, but Marx's point is that once it does, it will inevitably kind of gradually, you know, transform those, you know, social relations. And in a way that capitalism's great force is that it's not, um, you know, it's not, a, well, I mean, you know, it, it, it's kind of, um, it can reshape any culture or any set of historical practices or, or conventions, you know, to, you know, to suit its own purposes. Um, so, yeah, so that's why I think, um, yes, I mean, the relationship between within, even within, you know, so-called advanced capitalist societies, you know, there are feudal and even ancient strata. Um, um, and then all these, I mean, the debates about Russia, I mean, Lenin's kind of, you know, discussions about, you know, Russia and Russian capitalism, you know, um, it's, uh, so I, I don't see any straightforward, you know, kind of uh, discontinuity between, you know, um, the way in which capitalism can coexist with pre-capitalist institutions and relations in Europe and the way in which it, it does so, you know, in the, um, you know, in other parts of the world, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, through colonization. I mean, uh, but we are talking about emergence, I mean, you know, genesis of capitalism. Ah, yes. You know, um, it's, you know, once it is the dominant form, it can sort of appropriate all these forms and, you know, use them, whatever. But mm -hmm. you're talking about emergence of the capitalism. Yes. Primitive accumulation itself, uh, which strictly framed uh, to where capitalism arises in capital first volume. Mm -hmm. I mean, Spatiali. Spatial, like, you know, certain parts of Hungary and, you know, where certain parts of Germany and Britain and so on, you know, there where the capitalism arised. But primitive, I mean, the capital, I mean, what you are saying, the labor force is the virtual source of that capital, mm -hmm. which was never, so speaking, accounted because it's the slave labor. But it was present in the initial formation of and genesis of the capitalism because without which capitalism wouldn't arise. Mm -hmm. There wasn't enough labor force for capitalism to arise. No matter how much country, you know, farmers you push into the cities, you wouldn't have capitalism at the end. You mm -hmm. would have another form of feudalism. Uh, that's why I see 
in a sort of deficit, which leads to a rupture eventually. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of this lack of income, so to speak, when mm-hmm. it comes to the analysis of money and you know capital sort of exposed. And this is why I see the failure is inevitable because there's an unaccounted input into the system Mm -hmm. in the very conception of it. And where inevitably somewhere along the line, it will, the account will collapse. It will, because it's never accounted. It's like a black money in the system never explained. You see what I mean? Uh, That's how I... The failure as such you know okay um, no no thanks that's um yeah this is uh i mean i'd need to know yeah i just i'd need to know a lot more than i actually do about you know um you know history and um you know i, I really don't know i mean i i agree i agree that like you know the um the account of the emergence of capital is you know, or how to make it, how to make such an account, um, you know, theoretically plausible is actually very difficult. And um, simple original accumulation is, you know, doesn't seem sufficient on its own. Um, Then that's why it has this curious status in Marx's own text. It has this kind of, he recounts it as something like, you know, he says it's written in, letters of fire and blood it's like you know and obviously that you know you know original sin original accumulation it's like this um he wants to i mean although it is what the status of of it is what kind of um historical you know event it is is i think quite um mysterious it's not um he seems to be saying that kind of this is um you know this is required in order to account for you know dispossession occurred and we need to kind of you know account for dispossession as a condition of um you know the capital relation um but um but all, all also you know, capital itself, like industrial capital, merchant capital, you know, arises before, there are different kinds of capital, industrial, so Marx, you know, wants to kind of focus on industrial capital or see that as a kind of, um, you know, the culmination of the development of capital, but like merchant capital exists. um, So the way in which capital assembles itself historically is I think very complicated and, but I think that Marx, you know, knew that. And this is why I think that he doesn't just think that, you know, um, the account of originary accumulation is not supposed to be kind of, um, you know, here's an explanation for the emergence of capital. I think it has another, it plays another role in, in his kind of um, his system, or at least in the, uh, you know, the, the system of capital. Um, but no, that's, I mean, your, your points, you know, I, I agree with the, um, the points you were making about the problems. Um. Okay, great. Um, so Ray, I know it's, uh, it's been about uh, three hours now, so it's up to you if you'd like to, uh, to move on. We do have a few more questions in the chat. Um, I, so can t- like I can do a couple more questions, maybe you know, two or three more questions, and then I'll have to stop. Um, so, if you, you want me to read it, or you have to read it yourself, going back to uh, to uh, Simin. Um, um, I can read it for you, Simin. Uh, so- Simin, okay, yes, um, okay, yes, I see it, I see it. Um, so I'll read, I'll read Simin's question. Um, According to Gotsari, after the 60s, capitalist production has become the production of subjectivity. What is the concept of resistance and struggle in the current situation? Um, well, the short answer is, you know, I don't know. Um, I mean, yes, the production of subjectivity, in a way, that's part of what, you know, even Marx is acknowledging the same thing when he, when he talks about the way 
in which capital, you know, um, you know, imprints itself upon, you know, the minds and bodies of laborers, and it reshapes their minds and their bodies, you know, to satisfy its own ends. And that's that process, you know, has been, you know, going on for a long time. Um, so I don't think it's new. I don't think this idea that, um, I mean, I guess the question is what you mean by subjectivity when you talk about production of subjectivity. Um, is this, is the, you know, is in a way the way is, is an, you know, is this account of the production of subjectivity, is this required because does the production of subjectivity do something that, for instance, ideology doesn't do or ideology can't do? And I know that Tosin Guattari hate ideology and, you know, think it plays no role. Um, I disagree with their assessment. I think it does have a, you know, a role to play. Um, so, um, the link, I mean, obviously like, you know, resistance and struggle, everything depends on whether you think there needs to be, you know, um, whether subjectivity is um, a product of resistance or a condition of resistance, okay? And I think, you know, it's more plausible to say that, um, you know, subjectivation happens in and through resistance and, and and again resistance here needn't be i mean look people and workers resist capital simply because they find it impossible to live it becomes it makes their lives increasingly impossible uh and the way in which they resist you know their you know their resistance can take you know myriad you know microscopic forms I mean, the question is whether, you know, how this kind of, um, how these small, you know, localized gestures of resistance can be gathered and, you know, coordinated into something, you know, into, into a political form. Um, and, um, and here it depends what your analysis of the situation is here, it depends what you think it depends how you understand your oppression makes all the difference to how to the nature of your resistance if you think um it's just about um you know if you think it's about corruption for instance if you think that you're kind of um you know the problem is corruption or um you know dishonest politicians then you might you will still kind of you know, invest your hopes in, you know, electoral politics, perhaps, but if you think the problem is deeper, and if you think that it's, um, that um, class and uh, exploitation have something to do with it, um, then you'll realize that, um, you know, it's not possible to kind of, um, the electoral politics won't be able to kind of deliver the um the political results one hopes for so um um i like what um frederic lordon i think he's you know he writes about this you know resistance and struggle and the struggle against capitalism and um he's one of the most lucid you know writers about you know uh, the the stakes and the scope of the struggle um, and um, naming capitalism, you know, at least just calling, you know, um, naming uh, the root source of the oppression is, is crucial. And just calling it by its name, I think, is the first step. Um, because then you'll see that a struggle against capitalism is more daunting but also more you know perhaps more kind of you know um radicalizing than a struggle against you know some other kind of um you know a more um 
you know, a more manageable form of injustice. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I can't say much more, I'm afraid. Um, um, okay, I'll go through the next questions. Um, Ayn says, capital makes history more, can we say that capital makes history more dialectical? Um, do you mean um, the concept of capital or the book capital? Um, if, you, if, you, um, if you're there. Um, I mean, this, in a way, yeah, this takes us back to the, um, the problems, you know, I was trying to articulate in my response to the first question. Um, um, I mean, look, in a sense, the answer is, yeah, like, in a way, that's the point of Dardone Lavelle's criticism is that they say in the final analysis, you know, Marx's account makes the overcoming of capital or the, or the kind of the, um, the self-destruction of capital, um, you know, um, a dialectical process. In other words, it is internally contradictory and it's this, it's, 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 it's internal contradiction that is its undoing that leads to its overcoming. Um, but here, um, so in this sense, you know, if the uh, if the transition from capitalism to communism is dialectically necessitated because of the um, you know because capital is a moving contradiction, um, then the answer would be that ultimately you know Marx does end up resorting to a dialectical account of history and but that's exactly the problem that's 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 what uh, the that's the uh, that's what i take uh, dardo and laval's criticism to be um, um i don't think i mean i think you know his account of the the contradictoriness of capital is you know really completely compelling then the question is whether the question is whether this Contradiction has a subjective, um, you know, dimension, or whether it can be kind of um, whether it can be subjectively um, manipulated or, or affected in some way, and um, that's the uh, that goes back to the question of like is 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 the class struggle um, within capital really ultimately. Um, simply about um, you know um, intensifying the contradiction to the point of its you know to the point of explosion um, or can it be something else um, or can it or is it a way of actually um, you know appropriating the contradiction and actually using it as a weapon okay that would be the the other alternative um, Okay, I'll go to the next question. Um, Max um, asks, how do you see the relationship between primary and real subsumption in relation to the argument of the increasing autonomy of capital, i.e. in the accelerationist reading? How would you respond to the argument that capitalism in the process of real subsumption is abandoning human elements and replacing them for their own fully capitalist ones and in the process eliminating human agency and the ability of self-determination from within. <clears throat> um, I think, um, although capital wants to reshape, um, you know, human needs and desires, um, you know, to, to suit its own ends, uh, in a way, um, the extent to which it does this, it doesn't want to, um, it's one thing to say that labor power is incorporated um, into capital is a kind of a, you know, becomes an elementary presupposition for capital. 
um, it's another thing to say that the bear, the human, the living labor, you know, that 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 carries labor power, can be turned into a, a machine part. And that this is, I don't think that that can be the case. And it can't be the case because, in a way, in order to um, the sphere of consumption requires the availability of you know desires and appetites which are not um requires the transformation and in a way the kind of the the sometimes more or less unforeseeable transformation of needs and desires um so in other words um you know capital you know exploitation happens through the wage relation um, and the wage relation means entails the, you know the, the separate the distinction between you know living labor and labor power, and capitalist capital consumes labor power but not living labor, okay, um, and it can't eliminate living labor altogether because then that would destroy the wage relation because then you wouldn't have wage laborers you would just have slaves, and but then you can't have you can't exploit you know, you can't, um, I mean, although slave labor plays a role in capitalist accumulation, you know, or at least I don't see how you could have um, a capitalist economy, you know, um, based entirely on slave labor. So it looks like the kind of uh, the distinction between um, living labor and labor power is um, necessary and living labor has needs and desires um, which, you know, must be, in a way, independent of capital, so that capital can then kind of, um, you know, um, expand to satisfy them, in a way. So in a way, it's the kind of uh, um, the, um, the impossibility of the complete absorption of living labor into capital that is necessary for capital's um, you know, expansion and accumulation. Um, because if, um, if the desires and needs of living labor could be simply fixed by capital once and for all, then um, there wouldn't be um, you know, the, there'd be a restriction in the, the range of commodities producible, you know, needing to be produced. So in a way, that's why I think that capital can't, um, you know, wholly, um, it subsumes labor power and it subsumes, but it doesn't subsume labor, living labor in the same way. And it, it can't, for um, for structural reasons, because if it did so, um, it would um, you know it would diminish um, the the sphere of consumption. Okay? The sphere, and the sphere of consumption um, needs to keep expanding as um, for the you know for the valorization process for the conversion of surplus value into profit. So so I guess. Um, so in a way, so I think that capitalism wants to shape and constrain, you know, human autonomy or human self-determination, but it doesn't want to eliminate it altogether because it can use it, okay? It can, it can use it. Um, so that's, that would be my response. Um, uh, and May has a question, but isn't primitive accumulation really an ongoing process? How to understand the ongoing colonial wars, whatever. Yes, it absolutely is an ongoing process, and I think this is, you know, Marx, you know, says this that in a way, the capital's, you know, self-reproduction entails the reproduction of originary accumulation. So it's something that keeps happening. It's not something that happened once at the beginning and then stopped. It's something that is repeated in the process of capital's, um, you know, self-reproduction. Um, um, okay, I think that's it. Is that it? Um, yeah, I think that might be it. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Okay. Um, 
for uh, for uh, for staying this uh, this late. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, thanks. Okay. Thank. Uh, very. Um, thanks again. Um, thanks for the invitation. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks everyone. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. Um, Great. Okay. Okay. Um, good night. Good night.